There was once a very good and gracious king who lived in a marvelous, beautiful castle on the mountain. And he looked down and he saw his citizens, the people of his country, in poverty, hungry, confused, living in shacks, living on roots and berries. So he sent out a proclamation through his royal messengers to come up for a royal banquet at the castle. So on the appointed day, all the people who were hungry, hundreds of them came up and there was an enormous room with enormous tables spread out before them, many servants attending all the poor and hungry people who came up. And the king from his throne overlooking the banquet hall invited everyone to eat as much as they wished. Enjoy themselves. This is yours. It's free. I want to give it to you. The food is good. I know that you are hungry. Here is your royal banquet. Avail yourselves of it. So the king who was wise as well as good as well as generous watched the people as they sat at the banquet table. And he noticed something strange, that these very, very authentically hungry people, they were underweight and their faces were thin and they looked hungry. And they were hungry. So the king observed a strange thing, that while everyone was pretending to eat of the royal food set before them, pretending to eat, they weren't eating at all really. Instead, they took the food, the beautiful breads and the honey and all the other good things, and they put them down inside their clothing, kind of got rid of them, while pretending to eat. The king knew what was going on, and he knew that they didn't understand what was going on, or they wouldn't have done it in the first place. So he just watched them, and pretty soon the banquet was over, and all the people who had been invited went back down into the valley where they lived and remained hungry. <coughs> and some of the king's advisors who had also noticed this asked the king about it. Uh, they must have thought that this was going to be the last invitation they were going to get. I guess they were hoarding that food. I saw them put way inside their clothing as you did. The king said, no, 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 you don't understand at all. Let me explain to you exactly what was really going on. Put yourself in the position down in the valley of these people right now and I'll tell you what's going on. They're having a meeting right now, the people who took all this food, and before they came to the meeting they took this food they'd hidden away and had thrown it outside, cast it aside out to the dogs. They didn't want the food. And they're having a meeting right now to plot against me and the castle. They're holding a council of war, as a matter of fact, as to how to invade, attack this castle where all this abundance is, because they think, they think that I invited them up here to poison them. You must understand, ministers of mine, that the people down there are sick beyond description. There's no way I can explain what I see about their sickness. But when I invited them up, instead of saying, I'm hungry, I'll try this new food instead of roots and berries. I will try this new food to see how it tastes because their, their hunger and their sickness has made them, driven them mad. The only thing they could think to do was to be suspicious. And instead of even tasting the food to see how good and wholesome and healthy it was for them, they only knew one thing to do because in their minds, in their sick minds, because they're an enemy of themselves, they think everybody else is an enemy, including the king, myself, who invited them up here to feed them and make them healthy again. This is the way they, their minds operate. I knew this from the start, but I knew there was no, uh, nothing I could do because they're responsible for their own condition. 
And this indeed is what happened. The king's uh, explanation was quite accurate. When they got down there, they all got together and secretly sneered at the king and took the food and, and threw it out. At the same time, because they're in such strange contradiction, they decided that they, they want to come back to the castle, but they wanted to come back on their own terms. They wanted to take it over and wreck it. Do you understand, by the way, yeah. to slip aside just a little bit, that if you give a man who's a wreck and, and poor, you give him a million dollars, it'll be gone the next week, yeah. and he'll wreck the castle you gave him? He will. It actually happened. A perfect example, a few years ago, a government, the government built an enormous complex of apartments for the poor people. The poor people came in, it is now closed with shutters over the doors and windows because the poor people, instead of living there and appreciating it, stole the plumbing out and peddled it for a few dollars or broke the windows. It's, it's no longer in existence because the people wrecked it according to their own wrecked natures. That's all they could do. So the people in the valley below, still hungry, always hungry, of course, because they're not getting right food. They're only subsisting on berries, which don't keep them spiritually or in any other way intact. They began to collect their arms, their guns, and their swords, and plotted an attack against the castle, which the king knew was coming. So he told his uh, advisors, you can expect now these people, you see, you ask why I invite them up anyway. I invite them up because they can't harm me. I am giving one or two people in that valley, maybe a husband and wife in some cases, maybe a woman who lives alone or a man lives alone. I'm giving them an opportunity to come up here and taste for themselves to see if they want a new life, a true life. That's why I do it. And you, you should understand, if you understand the way the cosmic castle works at all, that, that there's no way they can do me harm. Well, the king's ministers, who weren't quite as wise as the king, didn't understand what he said. And, but, so they went into fear, because when, they, uh, when the wicked people who tossed out the king's gracious bounty, when the wicked people went down the hill, the guards, the sentries posted on top of the walls, could see them planning war. They could see the, uh, what do they call these things, ramming things, battering rams. And they could see the bows and arrows, and they could see them practicing. They could see the fire that they put on the end of the arrows to try to set the cattle on. And so one by one, the king's messengers, uh, sentries, ran up to the king's throne and said, King, I have terrible news for you. The people down in the valley that you befriended, they've turned against you, and they're going to plan an attack on the castle. And the king just dismissed it lightly. He was not concerned at all, and the sentry couldn't understand why the king was was not anxious as they were. And one by one, the passenger, the messengers came up and told him about the impending attack on the castle, and the king just passed it off. There's no way you can understand sentries, ministers. There's no way you can understand. They can't get in here. Don't you know that the walls can withstand anything? Is very simply to end the story. Very simply, there's no way that evil can penetrate beyond these walls because they're made of a very special substance, which I can't explain to you because you wouldn't understand. But I can tell you that as long as you remain inside this castle, you can't get touched. There's no way they can touch you. It's only if you wander outside the walls because you have still have a strange hungering for roots and berries and because you have a strange sort of loneliness in you that makes you want to associate with warlike criminals. Only then will you be in danger. As long as they stayed in the castle and listened to what the king said, even if they had the urging to wander out, the king eventually set up a system of, of cautions to the people. Now remember, if you wander out, you're going to get hurt out there. Stay inside the wall and you're safe. Just this morning, already, you have wandered outside the walls of the castle, haven't you? Right. Huh? 
little tense thoughts, little nervous thoughts, little irritable thoughts. That's what it means to wander outside the castle, to get irritable in the smallest way. Can't you, when you're walking toward that post office, when you're walking out of your home, when you're driving your car, can't you say to yourself when you get in your car, now all the way driving to the meeting this morning, I'm going to watch the traffic, I'm going to watch the other cars out there, I'm going to watch that pedestrian who might run out in front of me, that little child. I'm also going to be so wide awake that I'm seeing all my thoughts that are reactions to what's going on out there. And I'm going to stay so wide awake that I'm not going to wander outside the wall. I'm just going to simply be there in a state of knowing, a state of understanding. And if I slip, if I slip, I'm going to keep this warning signal going as much as I can, as best I can, in order to call myself back before I wander too far. You see, if you step one step outside the castle wall, it is easier to call yourself back than if you've gone ten steps or 20 steps. The farther you go, the harder it is because the noise of the criminals out there with their bows and arrows and battering rams, the noise out there cuts out the warning from the sentry of the wall, of the sentry on the wall who sees you wandering out there. And the time will come, and you will see for yourself, maybe you've experienced it a little bit, where you cease to wander farther and farther each time, and then the time may may come for you when you don't step outside at all because this little warning signal which is simply nothing but consciousness being wide awake being in a state of understanding not wanting anything not even wanting to be irritable not even wanting to be irritable you can see it rising in you you can, you can see it can't you if you're watchful you can see that other person coming towards you and you're gonna go oh. I wish I'd walked the other block or something like that and didn't have to meet him. You could catch that before it goes into irritation, and then you can either act on the physical level any way you want as long as you have caught it consciously up here. You don't owe anything to anyone outside that wall. I'm afraid that many of us still have the idea that we have something to give them out there. All, the only thing, you know, the only thing you as an awakened person have to give anyone out there is an invitation to come to the banquet. And this is all that ex is extended in this room, is it not? With people who go away after coming here once or twice pretending, as the woman did last night, to have enjoyed the feast. I know what she did when she got home, got out the door. She tossed it out. We don't send out messengers to people who have wandered out, determined to stay out there. That's as much as I wish to talk now, this morning. I may go back to it later, but for now we can go into comments and questions if you have them. Yes, Tom. That was the first time I've made uh, rapid connections all through the story with with real life situations. Before this, all the, all the stories have I've had to look at them later on to make the connection. Yes, and all of you do understand that the stories are told with that very purpose in mind to connect them with something in actual life, and you do it naturally anyway. I know that. Effective as of right now. There will no longer be long silences in the room unless I request it. Sometimes you see me go like that. That is a requesting, a long silence. No longer. You will ask questions or you will make comments. And if, you, if there's an extra long silence in the room, then every single one of you will be fined a dollar. Yes, Linda. <coughs> Does that mean as you're walking through the door, you're aware of your breathing, and then once you get that down, you add something else? That is correct. They vary a good deal, yes. I have my own. You have your own. I don't always assign myself the same ones I assign to you, for example, touching your hands together. I assign myself different ones. 
and I will now give your assignment while I'm gone. Listen carefully, please. <coughs> Effective as of today, and until I return, that's quite a while now, Effective as of today, until I return, for the first time after 12 noon of every day, the first time after 12 noon that your two hands come together for any purpose whatever, you will be aware of it. Effective today at noon, the first time after 12 noon, every day until I return. Now. Watch yourself shaking your head about three days from now. <laughs> the villagers have a chance. The villager has a chance if he will attempt to eat some of the food yes. that he brought home from the banquet, regardless of what all the other villagers do. Correct. And learns to prefer the new food. That is right. And do please speak loud and clear so we can catch your comment on the mic. Uh, there's such a work, such a work project like that has made it very clear to me that I don't hear. Yes, yes, that's the purpose. Everyone, every new person who comes here is in a state of arrogance, spiritual arrogance, psychological arrogance religious arrogance, whatever you want to call it. He thinks that he can do things. We're here to humiliate ourselves, aren't we? Healthy humiliation. They don't want that humiliation. They want to be religious. Heaven help them. No, heaven won't help them. Yes, Paul. The, that kind of an exercise is very beneficial to breaking mechanicalness. Yes, is it? Is it more beneficial to have more exercises or just try and do one at a time? No, no. You load yourself as much as you conveniently can. Now, once you've loaded yourself with as much as you conveniently can, overload yourself to the point where you can't do anything anymore. That will give you some idea of how much you can handle. Don't give yourself just a little. Give yourself a whole lot. Never mind. So you, you forget nine tenths. That, that's not important. The important thing is to give yourself more work than you can do. Anybody can do what they can do. We're trying to do what we can't do. And one of the things we want to do is to see that we can't do. Explain that, Linda, please. You nodded. I can't do anything. Yeah. Okay. You can't do anything when you're mechanical, and you can't do anything when you're conscious, as was explained last night, because there's no one there to do anything. There is someone there to live. There's someone there to understand. There's someone there to be one with the river. Margaret. Yes. Uh, one of my big problems has been I have always attracted some very, very sick people and as a result allowed uh, them to be dependent on me. Excuse me, Margaret. Uh, you too, and all of you who tend to give long discourses, you will make it short, please. Now proceed. Allowing sick people to be dependent upon me has been my problem and as a result I've been de-energized. But this week I experimented with that. A sickie rang my doorbell, and I knew she was sick, but I was able to see her as that and get outside of myself, and she didn't drag me down. It was Con okay. Congratulations. Good practical work. Get rid of your friends. Yes. Your friends are your enemies. I, I, not you, Keith. You don't speak clear. Vernon, you once said that if we attempt to hold a mental image of ourselves in our mind, it's impossible to do consciously? It's impossible to do. Leave out the word consciously. Hold a mental image in your mind is simply the, the flow of thoughts, and it won't be steady anyway, because it's the very nature of thoughts to switch, change, alternate. You see, remember we covered that? Well, we've covered it a thousand times. What kind of a person are you right now seated in this room? Will you be that kind of a person an hour from now? Once you understand that it's the nature of thoughts to change in many ways, 
that will give you help in not grabbing onto one of them and saying, I am that thought. I am no thought. What you said last night is a matter of fact that I don't see the change from one thought person to another. I still have the illusion that I'm more or less continuous. Yes. There's no continued self from moment to moment at all. It appears to be because thought is operating as me. One minute I'm an angry person, the next minute I'm a, a peaceful person. You're neither. Besides, your peace is simply a temporary absence of your outrage. Jim. We're supposed to catch the devil behind the twelfth tree. Are there ways that the devil, or like anger, disguises itself and will manifest in different ways? Do you know, good, do you know, Jim, and the rest of you, that a minister, a clergyman, can stand up in his pulpit and give a speech of 45 minutes in a state of rage, and he does. <clears throat> Only he uses words that say peace and tranquility and brotherhood and God and Christ. Do you, I, I, look, don't lie to me. Do you understand that anyone who gets up and gives a sermon about love and peace and humanity's inner greatness, don't you know that he has to be in a state of rage, anger, because he's in a state of lying? Don't you know that minister hates what he's doing, but he's trapped? He hates everybody out there that he's talking to about love, and that's a fact. I'm not being funny or dramatic. So indeed, thoughts can disguise themselves, states can disguise themselves. If you told him, if this was a room full of ministers, you know what would happen to me? Yes. Mm -hmm. I'll give you one guess. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to think about it. <laughs> Is it going to be an intelligent question, Leland? It's going to be an interesting comment. All will be enlightened. <laughs> <laughs> talking about ministers. Suppose, I don't want any more glory as all. Hey, talk about uh, <laughs> ministers who uh, are supposedly representing Christ. These are Christian ministers. When I was home, I read in the newspaper that the state of Virginia had proposed to have as their capital punishment not electrocution in the electric chair, but to have simply a drug that the person would take and then they just sort of go off peacefully to sleep. That would be the end of it. And amazingly enough, these so-called Christian ministers all went down to this committee that was considering this to protest that that form of capital punishment was not suitably gruesome, that it wasn't painful enough, that it wasn't awful enough, that these people on their way to dying had to be made miserable. These are the Christian ministers. Oh, yeah. All right. That was Leland's comment. Who's next? Frank. I, in the beginning, think I'm smart, and then when I try to do a work project and fail, the thought stupid comes in. Realizing that that's false, I try to go towards smart. I know that's not <laughs> where I am. You're really confused. <laughs> yeah, but that was a good point. He, he was suggesting we should not identify with the dumbness. Can't you just see that you can't remember the project? Don't it might not even remember to do it. You know, remember to try to do it, to say nothing. Three weeks later, you suddenly remember you forgot it after you walked out of here. <laughs> Somebody. So you're somebody. <laughs> <laughs> well, not really. <laughs> Until a human being learns the principles taught in this class, they will always be in a state of rage. Yes. How many of you are in a state of rage you don't show us? Yeah. Huh? Trapped? What do, you, what do you feel trapped by? Your circumstances, your marriage, your past? What are you tra what's trapping you? 
You are your own trap. You don't know it. You're looking for a way out of the trap, outside of you. The very you is the trap. Vernon is his own trap. Gordon is his own trap. Who? No, uh, Murray. <clears throat> Vernon, are we trying to to put a space between who we are and our thoughts, like a de-identification? Well, the absence of thought leaves the blank space. Don't carry that anymore. Sometimes a question gets so confused. Okay. I don't want to make it worse by commenting. Go ahead. Yes, Franny. Uh, I'm, since you put in the new rule into effect about the dollar, I've noticed that we have a lot of people who have... <laughs> I, I don't want it to cause any problems or anything, but I was just sitting thinking and I'm, I don't want to go into a long speech, but the thought went through my mind that I could say, I will take up, if there's a silence, I'll take it up. Yes, I know why. You can pay me 50 cents for it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know whether it's a vagrant thought or not. <laughs> mm. Connie, loud and clear, please. Mind can remember to do a project. Yes. However, in a way, when we when we don't remember, and suddenly I realize that I have clasped my hands. That is something else that is remembering, right? That's correct. At the moment. Mm, who's that? That's Dorothy. Mm -hmm. Since this morning, Vernon since I got up this morning, I have been trying to see which eye I was in, the vice and virtue that you talked about last yeah, night. Yeah. And I see that uh, I'm constantly in a, either a state of rage or self-condemnation. Right. I swing constantly between the two. It doesn't seem to be any virtue. Yeah. There. There, look, remember, Dorothy, were you through? I'm sorry, perhaps you weren't. Remember that the you being is an illusion, but it appears to be very real because at the moment you only see one eye at a time. This is why it's so important. And I'll give you a little physical project on that. You take a piece of paper, a different one from last night, you see. You take a piece of paper and, and you put down what you were at 9 o'clock, then 9.05 you were uh, uh, something else, and you'll have a whole page full of different yous at the end of the day. Which one were you? You're none of them. You see, if you see that you are none of them, when you see that you are all of them, you will see that they're all fakes, all frauds, and this will be encouragement and knowledge for putting an end to thought so there is a little bit of this space where there's no angry chuck, no witty chuck or whatever. Alan. The way my mind presently works, it seems that the thoughts are either continuous or overlapping. But is there, in fact, a tiny interval between each thought that I can't see? That you can't see? Uh -huh. The interval is quite clear. It is consciousness. If there's blank, it merely means that a lot of thoughts are unknown to you way down in the corridor. The, the real blank between th two thoughts is a state of quite clear comprehension because it's you are not involved in it. The non, the non you can understand. Uh, no, I want to go back here. Ir Irma, please. Vernon, when I walk through a door and I remember that I walk through that door, I get a really delightful, exciting feeling out of that. Is that a right thing? Yes, it is. This is right work on yourself, and part of your system senses, doesn't it, that this is an entirely different experience than you've ever had. Uh, Ralph, please. Short and clear, please. Okay, you said the thing that's making you miserable is refusal to take what God has got to give you. And like saying, here it is, here it is, here it is, and you're saying, no, 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 I'm miserable. 
I forgot what you said. What is it that's refusing what's being given? I'm sorry, Ralph. I didn't follow that. Try once more shorter, please. Okay. You said the misery is a refusal to accept what God is giving you. Oh, yeah. Okay, fine. What is it that's saying no, 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 when it, all the time it's... The, the gift is saying what is saying no yeah. your weariness of being Ralph before you made the rule you know the devil seemed to meet you asleep and after you made the rule the devil seems to start running more inside the person. what rule the ones all the time you get nervous I mean I'm nervous to raise up my hand I don't know why Man, you want to sit back and let someone else take the chance of being rebuked or saying a dumb thing. One, two. And I think Ralph's question was, what is it in me that is saying no to God? Uh, I asked you, let's go into the silence, and you said, let's go into the noise. Can we go into the silence? The silent mind? No. Uh, I, I would like to get rebuked, but then I wouldn't like to get rebuked. Mm -hmm. I would... I know that that's, right. that's something very valuable, but I really never handle it properly. Yeah. Why don't you want to go into the silence? Next question. Joan. The idea of righteous anger. I don't think we've ever talked about it that way. That ties in somewhat with the minister. And I think I was able to use the illustration of Christ in the temple for about three years to justify my anger. Which everybody does, of course. That's That's been brought up more times right here in this room. Yeah. You will know what conscious anger is when you know what conscious anger is. <laughs> Sally. That was my comment, that there is such a thing as righteous anger, but not the way the minister chooses. Yeah. You know, when you're... When you, Let's, we'll take an animal this time. If you're rebuking your dog for something, if you really, you know, rightly care for the dog, you're doing it not to hurt the dog, but to correct him, right? Mm -hmm. There's nothing in you that wants to hurt the dog. You want to stop him from biting the mailman. Yeah. And the dog can't understand. Please, Fido. It is bad manners to bite the mailman. He won't understand that. Now, Fido, he can feel your feelings, can't he? Dogs, dogs have emotions. They can understand in their doggy-like mind. And that's what your, your shots are all about, is dreaming to Fido. <laughs> Good morning, Fidos. <laughs> <laughs> we, during the break, we'll be serving uh, Alpo. <laughs> uh, one, two, and then a break. This thing about dogs, I was raised on a chicken farm. We had a dog that killed chicken. We tied a chicken around a dog till he got sick of dragging it around. He never followed him no more. All right. That comes under the heading of not putting of, of putting unpleasant pictures in people's mind, by the way, Frank. Go ahead, Lynn. Actually, what Vernon is doing is consciously knocking out all of the artificial supports that have kept us together so far. If it can be knocked out, it's obviously artificial because the castle itself cannot be attacked. Yes, good comment, and that will be a sign for a break. <coughs> Okay. Oh, any other announcements? Uh, write down the sentence, please. It is the invented self that shakes and nothing else. Mm -hmm. It is the invented self that shakes and nothing else. If I shake, or if you shake, that's the wrong part of me that's shaking, a part that I have not seen yet as being in possession of my life, and I've not got rid of it 
by yielding to the one power that can get rid of it, which is truth itself. Have you noticed how eager we are to suppress our nervousness in front of other people, our shaking? Here we are quivering like crazy emotionally and mentally and even physically. Maybe we cl clutch our hands together like that so no one can notice. We consider it a shameful thing to be nervous. And let me tell you, please, it is not a shameful thing to be nervous. It is just a terribly inconvenient <coughs> state for any of us to be in. Nervousness is not natural to God, to truth, to reality. It's an unnatural state that we don't have to put up with. But we have to go through an endless, endless number of dark tunnels before we see this. Because this nervousness is like glue. Nervousness is glue in that it wants to keep us attached to our old ways, to our old nature. And it's very hard to crack this glue because it's had so many, many years to settle down and harden. Whenever we see ourselves nervous, whenever we see another person nervous, don't condemn it, don't criticize it, just go ho-hum, something else to work on. It simply means that at least a part of us has wandered outside the castle walls. No wonder we're nervous when you get outside the cosmic castle because you know, you sense rather, that you're at the mercy of all those sickies out there whose one grand glorious aim in life is to try to conquer goodness. And in their false attempts at conquering the castle, which they can never succeed at doing, all of us know that thieves fall apart, that criminals who band together to try to attack either rightness or wrongness, they can succeed in attacking wrongness because they're attacking something on their own level. You know that those thieves who gather together, you, you make yourself partnership with another man or another woman in order to hurt someone else or stealing advantage over them. Can't you see that there's parts in you that are ready to turn on your partner? And you know what your partner is thinking too, don't you? He's ready to turn on you too. All right, you are on for questions and comments. No long speeches, please. So, Vernon, this nervousness then is an outcome of our suppression of all this rage and fear that we have, and we don't even, it's just down there, we don't see it. It comes out of the nervous yes. giggle or something. So, certainly part of it, and it connects very much, as you will now see. Watch how you make a connection when I say this. Nervous is intimately connected with a feeling of helplessness. You want to do something, but you don't know what to do. Or rather, you know 50 things to do, and you think that one of them is going to be the right thing, but you don't know which one. No wonder you're nervous and frustrated. Shall I go left, right, up, down? You don't know which course. None of the courses is going to save you. All the, if you happen to hit on what you call the right course, it will give you a brief thrill and a brief comfort. You said the thing that calmed that angry person down. I, I did the right thing. Now you have to think of the next right thing to do when he gets mad again. There's a beautiful state of living which is known as the state of no choice at all, except on the everyday level of white bread or wheat bread. And... Uh, Juan will now help us. That's what uh, Sarah just asked me. What you answered, that goes back to what you said last night about giving up or dying to a false sense of identity of being a right person. Yes. I'm going to the pain of yes. The right, right. We always insist we're right, don't we? Mm -hmm. Do you know that all of us, to the degree that we are outside the castle, that is the degree that we're insisting that I am right and the king is wrong? How come, see, how come if you are right, or if I insist I'm right, I'm still hungry? How come I'm still nervous? How come I'm afraid of my friends out there? I'm afraid of those very people I have banded together with to attack the good king. 
I'm afraid of that person who's on my side. How come I'm still hungry if I have the answers? People will lie, you know, when you tell them that. Maybe you lied by suppression, for example, when I said that. If you already know what is best for your life, how come you're still still yearning for something different? If you have the answers, how come they're not making you happy? How come your answers are making you sicker? I think I'll count about six seconds of silence and then I will invite you all to go over and say hello to Sally in a tangible way. That was rather well said, wasn't it? Uh, I thought so. Came out pretty good. Go ahead. You were talking about no choice at all. Isn't a mechanical person's choice only the illusion of choice? Yes. And it's based on accidental factors. Even the fact that he'll see a billboard, that will be what makes his choice for him. <coughs> you see something physically out there with your eyesight, and that makes the choice for you. Or uh, the more another common way you add, you know, you split the page in two lines, advantages, disadvantages, whichever, if it happens to be advantages to take this choice, you go to that. But you're still not sure... And you're going to be worried, and you're going to you're going to be worried even when you make that choice, aren't you? Because you're going to say, "Well, if I'd married Bill instead of Ed, I would have been happier." You've been miserable with either one of the nuts. Actually, it is idealism that blocks this state of mind that you're talking about. We think that somehow there is a me who is going to approve or disapprove of what actually is. And it's this sensor that keeps me from seeing what is really the case. All right. Okay. Everything I'm doing or saying is towards the idea of what I think is right. And then when I'm shocked, it just scatters everything and creates an opportunity to see it as possibly being wrong. All right. Okay. This, uh, the comment... <coughs> we make about Christians produce a very interesting effect inside of me because I used to be one of sorts and, and now I'm talking about what I once was and by, by the way also when I was a Christian I did I hated a lot of people yes other Christ groups yeah. now I still hate a lot of people <laughs> <laughs> the minister gives the impression of being peaceful and spiritual until he runs into one of his sinners. And he changes into a vicious animal instantly. Yeah, you know you know what's dreadful? That it sparks something off, I'll come in. Thank you. One one of the most greatest hells a minister lives in is his his burdensome duty of correcting sinners. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm supposed to say something good. I'm supposed to say something from the Bible. Hurry up, memory, and give me something. Let me get it out of the way so I can go on to my hamburger. That's right. They're, they're, they have to compulsively play their role. Isn't that dreadful? What a trap. Go ahead. Fido's dish really is full. Pardon? Fido's dish, the dog's dish, really is full, but he keeps on begging for another biscuit. It's got to be something added to what he has. He, he thinks he has to add something to it. Yeah, yeah. We, we need a change of spiritual diet. How's that for a comment? Go ahead. Going back to Christians and their image, I have a neighbor across the street from me who came over a few months ago and invited me to prayer meetings, and her image is that she's very sweet. I noticed lately she has a dog tied out front that howls day and night. She can't see the contradiction there. No, and do you know that she enjoys the trouble she's causing people? Somebody walks by and all, the monster jumps out. And they're giving something their hundred percent concentration. Are they conscious at that moment? No. 
Do, do you understand that consciousness is an entirely different state than lost people live in? Don't you understand it takes years and years and years even begin to approach consciousness? You think you you think that your sick friends or maybe people in this room maybe one second out of the day are conscious. You're not conscious at all. You might have one second out of the day where intellectual understanding is beginning to operate correctly. That would be the first stage to consciousness. Don't be fooled by words. None of you in this room knows what it means to be above the word, above the thought. You don't know. Now take my word for it. And please don't delude yourself into thinking you understand. I hear you getting all these questions out and you talk about the silent space between thoughts. I know that you don't really understand that. I'm becoming more and more aware all the time that there's a side of me that knows that what you're saying is true, and then there's a side of me that just wants to bolt and run all the time. Sure. Good. Just watch that battle. That's conscious watching of the battle. And if you take the side of the part that wants to run away, you will never know what you did against yourself. Anyone who leaves here never, never, never will know what they did against themselves, that is, against eternity for themselves. I noticed I was out standing out front and somebody, a couple of people were talking about me. And my immediate reaction was to get suspicious about what they were talking about. But then I remembered you said, what is that to you? Yes. And that helped. Okay, let's see the hands of the other paranoids. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's even worse if they're at a little distance and they're talking together and every once in a while I turn toward you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Rudy. I have always uh, taken sides. I have always taken a group and separated them, and I say this side is better than the other side. I will join this side. And uh, when I do that, I'm, I'm, what I'm doing is joining the warring people against the king. That's Maybe right. Because That's right. I want to be somebody. That's right. And I know over there by what the king has said, I will be nobody. And, uh, but there is a suspicion in me that the king might be right. <laughs> and, You're afraid of him. losing sight. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Zena. Vernon, when we get sometimes just a glimpse of something that's just so short, would that be just a... You know what Zena's asking me? <laughs> She's asking me, Vernon, if I catch a short glimpse of understanding, will that be a short glimpse of understanding? The answer is yes, Zena. It will be a short glimpse of understanding. Yes. See how efficiently we can dispose of questions here? <laughs> It seems like truth is out to hurt us, but is it? It's not. No, it isn't. But your old nature will lie to you constantly, and the old nature of all your old friends and new friends will lie to you too, just by their manner. For example, you understand, don't you, that the things we are interested in can be a lie. The things we want to achieve can be a lie because we're thinking that they're going to affirm my old nature, make it real, but it won't, so therefore it's a lie. Ex exhaust, exhaust your follies, exhaust your delusions. Go have so many of them. That is, bring them up, get them all up. Try to get ten delusions up an hour if you can. Exhaust them, go through them. Don't resist anything. Don't avoid anything. The worst, 
sex maniac thought in your mind? Any sex maniacs in the room? <laughs> As if I didn't know. See, you become ashamed of these thoughts. That is avoidance of what's going through your psychic system. Look at it instead of judging yourself. And I saw a hand somewhere. Franny. Uh, aware, can we be aware when we're lying? It isn't lying if we're aware that we're lying. Is it, the question is, can we be aware of lying? Do you know that you can tell a conscious lie? Oh, yes, yeah. Huh? And you'd better sometimes. Right. <laughs> if a burglar says, are, are you allergic to knives? And, and he says, you say yes, he's going to stab you. I could have got a better illustration than this, sir. No, Irma. I'm watching myself, by the way, and it's kind of interesting. I don't want to waste time saying your name, uh, so unless it comes naturally, I just, Bleh. okay, in your case, <laughs> Irma. Vernon, I've noticed just recently how much we are so identified with our bodies. I work for a woman that is very identified with her look and her beauty, and very satisfied with her conceit and vanity. When she gets old and all that disappears, she's going to be in deeper misery. That's right. That's right. There are any of the others in you, this room identified with your beauty? <laughs> we got a few. <laughs> I see your hand, Linda. You don't have to wave it like a flag. <laughs> now, who was it raised their hand? <laughs> Go ahead. Improving it if you have to live. <laughs> <laughs> well, we all do our best. <laughs> when I go like that, that's the first beat of one, two, three. In our group, one person is having difficulty understanding that when you are negative, you are positive. This person was questioning, what does Berman Howard mean? <laughs> Did you explain? <laughs> the mental slip explained itself if they wanted to look at it. Hmm. Do you think you could come up with another example of lying consciousness? No, I don't want to go into it, no. I don't understand it. I know you don't. Go ahead. I've noticed this self-torture in um, trying to make myself beautiful or looking at an old man walking down the street and thinking, oh, someday I'm going to be old. And I don't have to put up with it, like you say. It's, it's very painful, the self-torture. Oh, yes, it is. And I've told you many times, if you, if you think you're the body, you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. If you think you're now young and beautiful... You're going to, as Irma pointed out, it's very simple, but you don't see it. See, you don't even see the simplest of explanations. You're going to be in trouble when you get old. You ladies who are depending on your lovely little figures to attract men, what are you going to do when you lose your lovely little figure? Why don't you solve the problem now, right now, so that when you get old, like that old man or woman you see walking down the street, you, they will. Everyone will look at you, at, at them halfway. Nobody knows as old people. They're not getting anything out of it. And besides, they want to avoid uh, associating with themselves. So that when you're an old man or woman walking down the street, you'll be walking down there in a, in, in, with a, a mind that is fresh and young. You know that's not the body. See, you're living in time when you associate yourself with the body. This is not fancy, religious, spiritual, esoteric talk. This is a fact. He said with some vehemence. Jim. When you look back in your life, do you ever say, why did I 
ever give power to the hoax and go along with it so long? Oh, well, I understand why I did. So there's no question. I understand why. Because I didn't know any better. If you did say, why did I do that, you would be regretting doing it. Would you yes, know? yes. I was, I was catching something wrong with a question, and yet right, too, at the same time. Sorry, Sally. That was all. It would be all wrong to regret y yes. ever having done right, what right. you've done. Let me say it. Let me see if, if I can get it through. <coughs> if I have wasted, say I'm 80 years old. Let's, let's take an extreme example. Here I am, 80 years old, and I have spent 79 of it living in the world in delusion, scared, sick. It can't happen in a year, but this is an example, and I have to compress things a bit. From my 79th year to my 80th, I work intensely hard on myself to grasp all this. When I reach my 80th birthday, it would then be the same as if I had just been born one second ago. You understand the example I'm trying to get over? There would be no time involvement at all. When I reach my 80th birthday, I would be, in fact, even better than born because we're born in error, you know, so this is even better than that. Time is no longer being created by my mind. I am no longer identified with the body, with age, with mistakes, with stupidities, with gains or losses. At that minute, there can't be any regrets. Only the invented self can have regrets over the past. I am free, fresh, eternally new at, on my 80th birthday. And if I look in the, the mirror, it's because I want to comb my hair if I have any left. You know, you, you, you like to be a... <laughs> you like to be a little bit neat in public, you know? There's nothing wrong with that. But you don't gasp over the absence of hair and then because you're not identified with your hair. And I'll tell you, one little, another little extra hint. This has to do with sex. Your sex habits change, too, as you grow older. You know, some of you are already getting interested, aren't you? <laughs> huh? if, you if you solve your sex problems right now, whatever the age you are right now, you won't have sex problems when you're 60 or 70 or 80. <laughs> some of you are thinking, by the time I'm 80, I know I won't have any sex problems. <laughs> <laughs> you won't have any sex regrets either. You, you say, I know a man who slept with a, a hundred women a, a year, and I didn't. I was married to one dull woman all my life. You won't have any regrets like that. Like you're free and fresh from that, too. Dorothy, did you have your hand up? No. Uh, Mark, please. I've met a man who's 65 years old, and he's still tied to sex thoughts. How old is he? 65. 65. And he still has lust. Oh, yes. If you can't uh, make it physically, you'll make it mentally and all that sort of thing. Regret is such an ugly, self-centered emotion, and it gives you an excuse to relive all the old, miserable past. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then you can say, if only, if only things had been different, if only I didn't have such sick parents, if only I had gone left instead of right, all this is nonsense. If you remember the, the sentence, if you're lost in the jungle, what difference does it make whether you take the wrong left trail or the wrong right trail? What difference does it make? You're still in the jungle. The trail out of the jungle goes up not horizontal. I have noticed that certain words I use, like lust, for instance, that usually there's a, behind it, there's a, a moral 
thing as if it's something wrong with it. Uh, that's it. Okay, next place. Rudy. I know there are many reasons for being lost or for having the nature that we have, but what has ruined sex more than anything else? Is there a certain specific thing that has ruined the sex sensor? Oh, yes. Yes, that's very simple. Your foggy nature. It fogs up sex as much as it falls, as fouls up finances or health or anything else. <laughs> yeah, Rudy gave me kind of a cute look. I thought I'd give him one back. <laughs> yes, Chuck. You know, two years ago, you said straighten out your sex center, and a thousand other parts will straighten out with it, or vice versa. A foggy mind can only produce fog. Yes. Okay. All right. <clears throat> One. <laughs> Thank you, Maria. <laughs> I was just, as you were saying that, I wouldn't know when anything was straightened out. <laughs> huh? You said straighten out so and so. I don't know if I'm straightening out. <laughs> you know, like you said. You, are you still in a fog, man? Yes. <laughs> I suspected it, but I didn't want to come out of it. <laughs> Regret is always saying, I could have and should have done better. I mean, it's, it's saying I should have, instead of doing what I did on the left, I should have done it on the right. So it's a two, two-pronged wrongness, thinking that if I'd done the opposite, that would have been right, but neither right nor wrong would be right. As if, as if we could have done better. Yes. As if our old nature could have done anything but simply fall into one of the thousand wrong choices because the invented self always chooses wrong because it's choosing according to its self-interest. How can I keep me in place? That's what self-interest is, you understand. Keeping the supposed me in place. Which choice will affirm me? You see, would I get more sense of false sense of selfhood they don't say false of course would i feel like somebody if i become a general uh, a business tycoon um, a sports hero etc i saw a hand somewhere <coughs> dorothy are regrets and self-condemnation the same regrets and they'll they're intimately connected sure they're i ask you a question. This connects a little bit without, the, without this uh, dishonesty business. Remember Christ healed somebody and he told his disciples, tell no man of what you saw. Mm -hmm. He wasn't really being deceptive. He was doing something necessary and protective because he knew animals as animals. Was he being deceitful when he when he said, "Don't tell anybody"? He was telling he's telling his staff now, "Don't tell them what you saw." Was they was he telling them to keep a fact away from them? No, he understood the nature of animals and what they tried to do with decency. Uh, look, a wolf can only rip apart a beautiful rose. <laughs> I had to work. <laughs> when he sees the healing message of the king, he wants to quickly spread it out. Who does? The young prince. Uh, wants to what? When he, heal, when he hears the, <clears throat> the healing message, or when he sees that the king does heal his sick nature, he quickly wants to go out and share it with others. This is his uh, mistake. Yes, it is. We all want to become preachers the minute we hear a little bit of truth. Yeah. Uh, Amy. You said the only place an old, embarrassing situation exists is in our mind. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. Now, if I can really drop that that old haunting situation out of my mind completely, does that mean that, that in the future it will never come up again by association? If you really drop it through consciousness, <laughs> through understanding it... It will just be gone. Huh? Absolutely. Why should you ever be embarrassed? Look, listen to me. 
wherever you go or whatever happens to you, why should you ever be embarrassed or uneasy about anything? You tell me why. The print, the king never is. The king is composed at all times because he has, he has no false self to protect or promote. He is at perfect ease with his own nature. Mm -hmm. You study embarrassment, saying dumb things or whatever. Go ahead, Alan. Embarrassment is the proof that there is an image <coughs> that is in right. my mind. That is correct. The image that uh, I should be more poised in my speech, more careful in my speech. Of course, perhaps you should be more careful. But if you're condemning it, who's going to correct it? Mm -hmm. Only something higher than the condemner can correct it. Wouldn't the idea of being a celibate be a refusal to correct problems in the area of sex? Retreating into a nunnery yeah. or a priestery? <laughs> oh, yes, that's right. <clears throat> you handle sex right when you, you don't have to bother to think about it except at the proper time. You don't. You don't think about sex when you when you're when you're sexually right. You don't think about sex. If you're thinking about it or feeling about it all the time, that means it's got you instead of you gotting it in the right place. One, two. Now I'm going to be thinking when is the proper time. <laughs> you think all the time. I know. Advertisement. The whole world is telling you that. You should be performing sex more in better ways. Oh, yeah, because there's profit in it. Sell your deodorant and stuff. Well, in line with that, it's also telling us we have to have young, healthy bodies, and this is the identification with the body we were talking about. So the world is constantly giving us ideas of what is right and good, and that's where so much of the pain and conflict come in. And when we're in a foggy, foggy mind, we swallow it whole, we believe it. Yes, Harry, please. Um, I spent 13 years uh, studying to be a Jesuit, and at the end of which time they questioned my fitness and suggested I should leave, at which time I was crushed, and after today, I think I should write them another letter of thanks. <laughs> right. I to I've told you in connection, a very short little talk here in connection with that. I, I, there is no experience more valuable than to be booted out. Believe me, to be left by someone. To have your beloved wife, husband, girlfriend, boyfriend to leave, send you a dear goodbye note. <laughs> so what you were saying a while ago about embarrassment is really a marvelous thing to see because you really caught an image. Mm -hmm. Caught that. Excuse me, which is really what we never want to do, and we want to avoid it and suppress it. Going into embarrassment is the suppression. It gives you something to do with yourself instead of just seeing. It gives you something to do with yourself, mm -hmm. underlying self. Ah, ah. <laughs> Applaud your act. <laughs> Uh, Gordon. You sure take a, take away a lot of old thrills. <laughs> <laughs> so that re that embarrassment then is the wall of resistance against the reality of what I'm really like. It's just that wall. That's that. right. That's right. That's what my comment is. Embarrassment is not washing. It's a it's an aversion to the work. That's correct. Did you say aversion? Uh -huh. Yes, that's a good word. I didn't think you knew it. <laughs> 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 
One. <laughs> I was going to suggest, Vernon, when there's a silence and you count to six, will you let us know when you get to five? <laughs> <laughs> Row out. Going back to that gentleman's question, there's a comment, the mob is never right because it is the fog, the mob. Oh, the mob is never right. What, what else are you going to add to that? A mob of animals that hate decency. And well, by the way, you know, don't you, that when all those, those beast human beings were seated around the banquet table, they were smiling at the king, nodding at him, giving him their, their thanks so much for the feast. There was a big difference in that and what was going on inside them. If you don't come back to these classes after having come once, you're the beast man, beast woman. While, while we're following our leader, Carter, this week, he's already changed his mind four times <laughs> on how to blow up the world. <laughs> yeah, okay, sure, I understand. What I said previously about observing the two forces working inside of me seems to connect to what you said earlier this week about you have to make a choice. You come to a road that splits, and you really have to make that choice. Well, you have to make a choice to stop making choices. This is a higher choice. Yes. This is a turning. This is the prodigal son choosing to return home instead of making choices as to whether he's going to eat roots or berries for dinner that night. Mm. Choose to return home where the, the king's table is in abundance. Franny? And, and the hard, the real, real hard part is deciding not to decide. I mean, that's where the real hell comes in. That's, that's good, not to fall into one of your many alternative choices because none of them can lead you anywhere but out in the forest outside the castle, to a different place in the forest outside the castle. He said basically what I was going to say, and that is the realization that there really is no choice. No. You, don't make, you don't really make choices at all. They are made for us. Whether in, where, whether, choices are made for us whether we're outside the castle or in it. Choices are made for us. But what a difference in the two levels of choices. God is his own choice, by the way. God chooses himself. When we are, oh, okay. when we are thinking in terms of choices or alternatives, it seems to me that we're looking for escape. For escape? Oh, yes. Escape. Sure. The maximum thrill from the choice. Which one will thrill me the most? Make me feel better. Make me feel less insecure. How many of you are insecure? You know, of course. Now, doesn't that tell you whether you're inside the castle or outside? All right. Now you know what to do. Start walking toward it and forget your dumb friends, so-called friends out there and the friends in here. We'll take a couple more minutes, then we'll stop. Frank. I can see where my low level still thinks the choice is either yes or no. That's right. And it's scary to face the fact that neither yes nor, yes nor no will do it for you, isn't it? Because what else is there? This means you're going to face the fact that, that there's no self behind the yes or no to be fulfilled by the yes or no. But this is, this is a, a healthy scare. Can you imagine such a thing? That's what it is, a healthy scare. And then you go through the dark tunnel of the scare and come out on the other side and see that it was based on a false assumption. False assumption that you had to get yes or no in order to keep yourself alive. Give up your life for the sake of truth and you will find eternal life. I paraphrase. Yes, Gordon. I act by my behavior as if I can choose God. Yes, yes. Gordon can't choose God. Chuck can't. You can only disappear. Then there's no question of choice anymore because there's no chooser. And when there's no chooser, then there is God. And you are one with that. 
Good morning. Good morning. Good morning.